the last year when I was still in Thailand. At the John Lee commemoration. They had invited a monk from a monastery in Bangkok to give a Dharma talk. He got stuck in traffic, sent word ahead that he wouldn't be able to get there in time. So they had another monk from the forest tradition get up and give a Dharma talk. He talked about how the Buddhist teachings were all about suffering. And then a few minutes after he had finished his talk, the other monk arrived. So they asked him to get up and give another Dharma talk. And not knowing what the other monk had said, the second Dharma talk was on the topic of the Buddhist teachings are all about happiness. And of course they're both right. The Buddha's first sermon starts with the issue of suffering. But it's for the purpose of happiness. We all want happiness, but we suffer. In fact, the things, many of the things we do to find happiness actually cause us to suffer. Not only do they cause us to suffer, they cause other people to suffer as well. And it's because we don't understand why they're suffering, what we're doing to cause suffering. That's why we're not happy. So the Buddha gave his life to finding the answer to that. Why do we cause suffering? And how can we put an end to it? And once he found the answer, he gave the rest of his life to teaching that to other people. So it is an important issue in life. The chant of the Brahma Vihara starts out. Ahang Sukito Homi, may I be happy. It sounds very simple, not very profound. Very commonplace. The reason it's commonplace is because it's the desire that lies behind every action we do. It's part of the Buddhist genius to say, well, let's look at that very carefully. Let's take this desire for happiness seriously. If you really want to be happy, what does it mean? What do you have to do? And as the Buddhists discovered, it's the first step in wisdom is to ask, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? It's the long-term that's important. You don't want a happiness that comes and goes and kicks you as it leaves. You want a happiness that stays. And you realize that it does have to depend on your own actions. So you've got to be careful about what you do and say and think. Because doing there isn't just physical action, it also includes the actions of the mind. And to get you very quickly to this issue of training the mind, why we're sitting here meditating. It's because, Ahang Sukito Homi, may I be happy. We want happiness at last. We want to order our lives around this issue. After all that, wish for happiness lies at the center of every action. So it only really makes sense. So well, let's make this issue clearly, explicitly, the center of our lives. When we're practicing the Dharma, it's not that we're going out there and practicing it for something else or for somebody else. We're training the mind so it can actually realize that desire, the desire to be truly happy. So we talk about making Dharma practice the center of your life. What it means is taking this commonplace desire and really taking it seriously.
And each time you act, ask yourself, is this really going to lead to happiness? Do I know what I'm doing? Or am I just acting on ignorant desires, ignorant opinions, ignorant assumptions? And if you see there is some ignorance, try to penetrate it. Get through all the darkness. Understand why you've had that assumption or why you hold on to that particular opinion. And is it really worth holding on to that particular opinion or assumption? Be willing to test these things in your actions. And keep that question of where is there suffering and why is it happening? And what can be done to put an end to it? Keep that set of questions central. These are the questions that lie at the heart of what the Buddha called appropriate attention, yoni somanasikara. He said of all the internal qualities that can be brought to bear on the practice, there's nothing more essential for awakening. It's keeping these questions central each time you act, each time you speak, each time you think. Where is the suffering here? What am I doing to cause the suffering? What could I change so I'm not causing that suffering anymore? What it would be like not to suffer? And then ask yourself, what activities would make you pull away from this set of questions to find, to claim that something else is more important? Well, look into those questions and look into the attitudes behind them. It's by keeping these questions central that this is how you commit yourself to the practice. These are the questions that always should come first, regardless of the situation. We sometimes think if only had a better monastery, if only had a better retreat center, if only had more time, I could really practice the Dharma. What really practicing the Dharma is this matter of appropriate attention coupled with mindfulness. If you're not mindful, you tend to forget these questions. Other things move in and take precedence. But if you can hold on to these questions and make them central, then no matter where you are, you're practicing the Dharma. So as long as the question of happiness and suffering is the central issue in your life, keep reminding yourself that it is central, and do what you can not to lose sight of that fact. So whether you're here at the monastery, off in the woods, back in the city, You have the set of questions as your basic framework for how you live. There's an unfortunate tendency to think of practice of the Dharma as a particular meditation technique, and then you squeeze that into whatever time you can find in the course of the day. You hope somehow that it'll start seeping through your life. Well, from the perspective of the Dharma, the technique is only a small part of the practice. Qualities of the mind. I actually use the word Dhamma to describe those qualities of the mind. Those are the things that are essential. You want to develop good qualities. And appropriate attention is primary. In the Buddhist discussion of the factors of awakening, in each case, each factor of awakening is fed by appropriate attention. So whatever the situation, you can ask yourself, what's going on here? Which of the Four Noble Truths am I dealing with right now? If there's stress, if you can identify the stress, we'll try to comprehend it. If you see a mental state that's giving rise to stress, particularly craving or clinging, do what you can to abandon it. Let it go. 
the letting go here. It's not, it's not like you're holding on with your hand and you have to release your grasp. I mean, you notice that you're doing something again and again and again. And the abandoning is to stop. I don't have to do that. I can do something else. And that something else can be the path. If you find that there are already metal qualities that are factors of the path, and do what you can to develop them. And try to see how much stress goes away as you're developing it. Those are your prime duties, and yeah, those are your central duties. It's like like they're being imposed from the outside. They come from that desire for happiness. You look in Western psychology, they talk about the conflict between the ego and the superego. Ego being your your desire for happiness, to keep your happiness alive. And the superego being all the different lessons you're taught by society, but you have to do all the shoulds that are imposed on you. And in tradition where the shoulds are not derived directly from the desire for true happiness, they can be very oppressive, and this is why there's such a huge conflict between ego and superego issues here. In the Buddhist teachings, they don't have that conflict. The shoulds all have to do with your desire for happiness. The conflict is simply that your desires, at all in different directions. Some of them are ignorant, some of them are knowledgeable. So it's a different type of inner conflict here. The shoulds all have to do with true happiness. And the conflict has to do with your unwillingness to give up certain habitual ways of acting and thinking. But if you examine them carefully, you realize that you're holding on to them is because part of you thinks that they will somehow create happiness. So you've got to look for yourself to see what your habitual thoughts, habitual words, habitual deeds actually do, actually create. Are they creating the happiness you want? This is why these desires can be trained, because they are based on the desire for happiness. They're simply misguided. And if you can work through all the issues about why they're misguided, then you find that the heart becomes more and more one, and more and more co coalesces and comes together around this, the desire to be truly happy, to find long-term happiness, to develop these qualities of wisdom and purity and compassion that can make your happiness true. So this is how you make Dharma practice central in your life. It's by taking that little commonplace wish, Ahang Sukhita Homi, may I be happy. It seems so commonplace, I'm almost embarrassed to say it. You take that desire and you take it seriously. So when we make Dharma practice central for our lives, it's not like we're submitting to something, some force outside that's going to come in and try to take over our lives. It's simply taking that little desire that's central to every action and learning how to treat it consistently, wisely. So it actually gets results.